Thanks for joining us for another Contagion Coronavirus video. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Erin McCreary, who collaborated with Dr. Jason Pogue on behalf of the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists to put together a review of early and emerging options for treating COVID-19. The review was published in Open Forum Infectious Diseases and will be summarized in an article on Contagion Lab. Dr. McCreary, thanks for joining me. Why don't you just jump right in and talk about what we know about appropriate management of treating patients with COVID-19. Thanks, Michaela. Thanks for having me. And thanks to everything, honestly, that the Contagion team is doing. You guys are doing an exceptional job keeping up with all of this. We know that it's a lot. And that is partially what motivated us to start writing this article. You guys actually reached out and said, we need to start making sense of all the data out there. And we couldn't have agreed more. Um, I think the most important thing to emphasize is that there is no antiviral agent proven effective for the treatment of COVID-19. Supportive care remains our standard of care, and that includes oxygenation, most importantly, and then everything else involved with supportive care. Appropriate management of patients right now, one of the best things to emphasize is just clear team communication and protecting your healthcare workers as well as taking care of your patient. So take the time to put on your PPE, over communicate with who's doing what on the team to manage these patients and throughout your health systems or your institutions. This is a time more than ever to appreciate your laboratory team and your infection preventionists. They are just doing amazing work around the clock, as, as is everyone. And then aside from all that though, the best way we can treat patients with COVID-19, both now and for the future, what we need to learn for the future is to enroll them in randomized controlled trials. And the control piece is critical because we have no idea if any of these therapies help. And the worst case scenario is that some of these therapies that we're experimenting with may hurt the patient. And it's our responsibility to our patients and honestly to the scientific community to answer those questions of what might hurt, what would help, what might hurt, what might help as robustly as possible. And so we also appreciate though that not every patient is able to be enrolled in a clinical trial. And so if that's the case, we understand that there's this overwhelming human desire to do something. And, and that's why people are trying experimental therapies, but none of these agents have been proven effective. And we must critically evaluate literature as it, as it emerges and make the safest decisions possible for our patients. So while none of the therapies are approved for treating COVID-19, I know that there are a lot of therapies that are being reported to show promise um, in treating these patients. So what are some of these therapies that you feature in your article? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's where we were kind of teasing into, you know, how do we cipher through with all the data that's available and, and make the safest possible decision for our patients? And so I think that's the most important thing to anchor on right now is what you said. We have no approved therapy. We don't know that any of these drugs work. None of them are proven to be effective for COVID-19. And the second thing we need to remember is that throwing the kitchen sink at patients really hinders our ability to tease out on the back end what may or may not have been effective. And then more importantly, again, what may have caused patients harm. So caution in, in moving forward with this, but of all of the proposed antivirals and immunotherapies that are out there right now, um, number one, enrolling a patient in a remdesivir trial, if possible, or they just switched from a compassionate use program to an expanded access program. Um, so as data comes out and as we learn how to enroll patients in the expanded access, that's prudent. That makes sense to try to get that patient in that trial or, or get remdesivir expanded access in the United, speaking just to the United States. Um, the possible benefit, and again, I'm not saying there's a benefit, but um, with what we know about hydroxychloroquine, the potential antiviral activity for a short course of therapy, at this time, that may outweigh the risks, but that's a discussion for each patient and for each treatment team. The toxicities and the drug interactions of chloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, ribavirin, and other agents that have been suggested at this time, the toxicities of those agents seem to outweigh any possible benefit um, and don't know that those can be recommended. And then finally, oseltamivir should be used for patients with influenza. Oseltamivir should not be used for the treatment of COVID-19. All of these drugs are not benign. They all have side effects, and those side effects include QTC prolongation, cardiac toxicities outside of QTC prolongation, hepatotoxicity, and then gastrointestinal toxicities like diarrhea. And those are all also manifestations of COVID-19 disease. So again, it's very important to tease these things out and take a lot of thought and pause before giving your patients potential antivirals. Um, 
The other thing that has a lot of discussion right now is long-term consequences of IL-6 inhibitors and or use of corticosteroids. Those are unknown, um, and I believe the role for using those agents right now is in the context of a clinical trial. Thanks so much for summarizing all of that for us. Um, so it kind of just seems like this situation is ever evolving. You know, information is coming at us left and right, day and night. So what is your advice for how infectious diseases clinicians can keep up with all the news and the development while, you know, responding to a pandemic? They can follow Contagion, and I promise they didn't plug me to say that, but you guys really are amazing. Your email announcements and everything you're posting on your website is credible. Um, it's resourceful, so Contagion, I think, is a great resource for people. Twitter, um, obviously, I love Twitter, but it's a constant news feed full of really amazing people. It's full of people who are trying to help and who are citing articles. I kind of scroll through Twitter every day and then and email myself articles and read them um, when I have time throughout the day and try to try to carve out, you know, time to evaluate COVID literature every day because every day you fall a day behind because so many things are coming out so quickly. I've never seen anything like it. I also worked with a librarian, actually one of my attending physicians worked with a librarian to come up with a PubMed search, which um, now that I'm thinking about this as I'm talking to you, we should include that search criteria because people can copy and paste that into PubMed and sign up for daily alerts for any article published that falls within that search context. So I'm happy to share that out. Um, and thanks to Gadi Hadar, who's one of my attendings who actually thought of doing that. And so I've been getting that report every day to stay up to literature that's published. Back to Twitter a bit though, is that not, there's a lot of amazing people putting out a lot of helpful things, but there are also a lot of people who put inaccurate information on social media. So please take what you see on the internet with a grain of salt and validate anything you read with the data. Know where that statement came from. Don't just repeat a statement that you hear. SIDP, the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacists, is working on drug literature review and updates as a pertinent chunk of information comes out. And so we released YouTube videos earlier this week um, that address the pharmacotherapy options out there right now that have reasonable discussion around them. The people who made those in videos are absolutely incredible. They turn that around very quickly and they're staying on top of it. So check out those videos. They're a great resource. And then I know we're all absolutely overloaded with emails right now, but clinicians and researchers should carefully read any COVID related email that's coming from your institution so you are aware of your local policies and procedures because and protocols because again we don't know we are doing the best we can and you need to know what your institution is saying so that you follow those guidelines um, and work on your team at your institution. I'll say group texts are saving my life right now as we all keep up with each other and try to keep each other up to date and try to share ideas. Um, so reach out to your colleagues. Um, and then joining professional organizations would be a last thing I think ID clinicians could consider during this time if you're not involved in IDSA, SHEA, PIDS, SIDP, and others right now, it might be a good time to join because there's a lot of community information sharing, a lot of email listservs, websites, um, email blasts, those are good ways to stay up to date as well. So in addition to just staying up to date, how can infectious disease clinicians work together within the community in order to, you know, stay strong and work through these difficult times together? Yeah, Michaela, I think that's the most important question you've asked and honestly, probably the most important thing we can we can continue to focus on other than taking care of our patients right now. Um, be kind. To one another it's easy it's simple just be kind to people right now everyone's doing a lot um, the new england journal of medicine published a paper a few days ago and that paper discusses fair allocation of medical resources so what would you have to do if you had to decide between two patients to get a ventilator if you only had one I'll say reading that paper is the second thing that brought me to tears during this. The first thing was when I started having colleagues across the country tell me about the young, healthy patients with no comorbidities. We're learning a lot about this disease as it progresses, and we know that patients, some a percentage of patients, get critically ill, and that includes young patients, which I think was underappreciated at the beginning of this pandemic. And that's, it's tough. And so those are the two things that have really hit me hard this week, but different things are hitting different people hard every day. We all went into this business to take care of patients. And so when that's, you know, what, what gets you going in the morning and your sole purpose for what you do, and then you have to make a decision on who gets a ventilator, I really can't even imagine um, being in that position. And so demonstrating empathy to your family, 
right now to your friends, to your colleagues, to people you don't even know, but that are in the medical community doing the best they can. Um, I think a simple how are you doing text goes a really long way and is getting a lot of us through. One of my mentors a week ago sent me this really amazing article that a, a business had put out about leadership during, during crisis situations. And there were two phrases in there that really resonated with me. So I just wanna share them kind of with the scientific community as well. The first one was a phrase of deliberate calm. So leaders and healthcare workers and families and anyone in this right now, deliberate calm is essentially the ability to detach from a fraught situation or a really reactive situation and then think clearly about how you're going to navigate your way through it. So I think everyone in the ID community needs to display a sense of deliberate calm to help each other make the best decisions we can as safe as we possibly can. The second one was a concept of bounded optimism. And so that is essentially confidence and, and joy, but with, with realism, right? Pause, assess, and then act on things and use your teams like you've never used them before. Collaborate. Be transparent with people about what's happening as much as you can share information out as possible and overall effectively communicate. I think that's been a theme throughout this. Um, and then the last thing the ID community can do is share what you're learning with the world. We need to know, we need to learn from each other like we never have before, but share what you're doing and what you're learning in a peer reviewed and critically analyzed fashion. It's like when Jason and I wrote that article, we sent it to six or seven people um, to peer review and they were incredible and they turned around thoughtful intentional comments for us very very quickly but as quickly as that paper got out it was thoroughly peer reviewed and um, social media has united the world like never before information spreads very quickly one wrong message here could literally cost people their lives so we are all trying to do everything we can to stop this and cure this but we owe it to our patients and to each other to be intentional and to take care of each other too. Thanks so much for those helpful tips and all of that thoughtful, um, you know, your thought, sharing your thoughts with my audience and me. Um, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Dr. McCreary. You're doing great work, so keep it up. And um, you know, you can keep up with SIDP on their website. And um, thanks so much to everyone, and especially to Dr. McCreary for this great interview. Thanks, Michaela. Thank you guys for your time.